really appreciate, really appreciate the support. Uh, tonight, we have three speakers lined up for you. The first of which is French Ben, who will be talking about Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows. Hello, hello. All right, everybody can you hear me? You're like, we're at the comedy show now. Um, uh, if anybody's standing up, feel free to go ahead and sit down. We have plenty of seats. Uh, if you feel that you can't see the slides, you can also move forward, and that will definitely help you see the slides. Um, so my name is uh, French Pen. This is my sort of like moniker. I tweet as French Ben. My real name is Ben Bonifoy. I'm a member of the technical staff here at Docker, and I will be discussing Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows and sort of like what is the glue that makes it all work. Um, as you may know, uh, Docker has been sort of like tr transforming the development landscape where we've been helping developers take monolithic apps and sort of like migrate them towards microservices uh, and these services is basically do one thing and they do it like really well. Um, we've had tremendous growth and we've seen that through our Docker pool. So early in January, and I'm sure this is a stat that you've seen sort of like rehashed a couple of times, uh, we've passed a two billion pool on uh, images, which means that a lot of developers are doing a lot of Docker things. Um, so the question is how do these developers sort of like get started with Docker? Um, the answer to that is they used to download this thing called a Docker toolbox, which we put together that had basically an entire uh, collection of Linux items, um, which bundled basically a virtual box, a boot to Docker um, image that we used to create a virtual machine, and also a UI, which was called Kitematic, that basically allowed you to control some of these pieces and gave you a nice uh, sort of UI way of seeing your containers and tweaking them and changing settings. Um, the problem is these components also introduced a lot of pain in the uh, user process because uh, there was no sure way to create uh, updates and sort of like notify the user that a better version of the toolbox was out there. Some of the installations were failing. Some of the VMs were not created properly. Some of the networking was not created properly. And overall, there's just a huge performance hit because of all these layers that were sort of added to it. And uh, file sharing was probably the worst one of them all, where you tried to really mount a folder and you didn't pay attention. It wasn't within like your user environment. Therefore, you could not do anything. Um, and the problem with that is that, well, most of our developers are actually on Mac and Windows. And therefore, we should solve the problem by making it native, by making it and the way we start in on this is with Docker for Mac, um, which is what we're going to be focusing on this evening. Um, but Windows uses the exact same component, more or less. So Docker for Mac aimed to really create a native experience for your Docker developers. Um, and this was done with an easy drag and drop application so that the installation was no longer waiting for a VM to be created, adding networks, making sure that everything worked correctly. It was a simple drag and drop from a DMG in this case where you take the Docker app and drop it into the applications folder, start it up, and you're done. We also wanted to make sure that it was secured where we had sort of like a sandbox creating around this virtualization that was for user only. It actually ran at the user level so that no root permissions were actually needed to get this running on a day-to-day -day basis. What we also wanted to get working properly was the, the network. Uh, if some of you work in an enterprise environment or simply change network very often, you knew from the toolbox sort of experience that it was very painful to get a, sort of like a stable Docker environment where you had to reboot the VM so that it would pick up your new IP and then everything would reinitialize hopefully 
so that you could actually do Docker pulls and Docker run of your containers. And finally, the last one was the file sharing, where, as I mentioned, if you mounted a volume, maybe it worked, maybe it didn't. And if it did work, chances are the UID did not work properly. And then also, you did not get any uh, event notifications, basically, I notify events in your container. And what I mean by that is that if you made it, uh, if you mounted the volume inside of your container, you made changes to files in that volume, the container would actually have no clue that you made those. And this is a common use case in like things like Node.js where you want to make um, you know, a change to the file, you want to reload the website, and then nothing happened because the bundle did re-kick over to actually pick up on it. So once we kind of built all this, we said we needed to test it and send it out to the community. And the community reacted. You know, we had tremendous response from the developer community. There was huge interest from day one, where we had just about like 30,000 uh, in 24 hours uh, users and developers that were basically interested. And I'm sure the team that is responsible for all of our sort of like social media got really, really annoyed because everybody started tweeting them and saying, "Give me access. I want this thing. I want it now." Right. But now that everybody sort of has it, it's been in public beta for a while, um, I would like to sort of go a little bit deeper and explain to you guys a little bit of what's under the hood. You know, what are some of the core pieces um, to what makes Docker for Mac work so well? And to do that, I'm gonna go through the virtualization, which is sort of like what makes it actually work on your laptop. Uh, the networking piece, which is obviously what allows it to talk back and forth. And then the file system, um, for basically the file system sharing. <coughs> so to allow it to run natively on your Mac, um, we had to create uh, what we call the HyperKit framework. Uh, this HyperKit framework leverages the hypervisor framework that actually exists in OS X since version 10.10. Uh, this is sort of like the less side of the things that you see here. What that allowed us to do was to run any of our processes as a user process. And that means that we could be confident that um, we relied sort of like on Apple's sort of security to then build something that would then ultimately run all of your Linux containers. The process itself um, basically run, runs a small like Linux kernel based on an Alpine Linux image. Um, and it has every, uh, or usually has the latest Docker pre-configured for you. Um, and on every update, it will obviously also update that. Uh, but the fact that it is a process that runs in your Mac OS X user space means that all of the logs actually get redirected towards your OS X host, which means that if I open the console app and I look through the logs, I'll see my Mac logs, but I'll also see my Docker logs sort of like all mixed in. As I mentioned, uh, we use a Linux distribution called Mobi, which is based on Alpine. Um, the image itself is very small. It's about five meg, which is what Alpine usually brings. Um, and we made it so that it was optimized for distribution, for fast boot, and also it is stateless um, for operations within the container. So when I start my Mac and I do into a terminal with Docker info, I get something that looks exactly like I would get on a Linux machine. And I don't have to initiate a VM, I don't have to eval my environment or any of that. I, it just works. The part of the virtualization sort of was to package all of our pieces um, into one app so that when you do update, you actually update everything. Um, so the app is self-contained, and the way we allow ourselves to update everything is that we symlink actually every single binary back into the bundle, which means that if you look at your user local bin environment and you look at Docker, Docker Compose, Docker Machine, they're all actually symlinked into the app itself which means that when the app updates, the client updates, and really ultimately your the Mobi updates. Um, and what's great about that is that Docker will basically start up, if you allow it, um, when your laptop starts up. And because it is fast boot, before you get the chance to open up a terminal, you have Docker up and running, which if you played with the VM before using VirtualBox was pretty much never the case. So some of the benefits that we gained from this virtualization stack is that we gained some in performance because your Linux containers are now running almost like 
Mac processes, which which is was done actually through the CPU virtualization extensions that uh, Apple offers. On the battery life, we get a slight hit, but and I say slight because it is very minimal, only because you're running actual containers and not Mac processes. And on the disk usage, which is I think one of the question that sort of like comes up, um, we used a QCAL2 file, um, which is in your user directory, which means that if you have multiple users on the same machine, they will all have different data in all different QCAL files, which means that between users on one machine, they can all run Docker, but they will not share the same images and all the same data. Um, currently, our limit for this image is 64 gig, and it basically grows in size. So it starts up, and I think we comes up as two gig maybe when it starts, and it will grow in size. And we're working to create some tools to resize it back down, but it really grows as many images as you get. So if you download something like the Big Data University, which I think is like four gigs, then it basically grows by four gig. And then because we know it's something that could be pretty big, we do, you do have the option to remove it from time machine so that it doesn't get backed up. Um, so now we'll talk about networking, which used to not work at all. Uh, and what we wanted was to sort of like abstract all of the details of networking and you know everything that you had to go through in VirtualBox to get uh, some of the Ethernet working and the bridge networking to work so that you could just get a connection into your VM was very painful. And we wanted to remove that. Um, a lot of the hypervisors were built with data centers in mind. And in a data center environment, you always have control over the networking. The problem is with laptops and developers and people moving around, the networking could be completely different. You may be in a coffee shop, you may be in like a local environment that has only a few things open. Uh, you may be within an enterprise VPN, which is very difficult then to inject into the VM. So the idea was by making this networking native, we could solve this problem, which was basically the VPN software incorporate um, policies that just do not work usually. And then also um, we wanted to remove the lookup of the IP for a VM, where if you run a service, you should just hit that service on localhost 8080 or whatever the port is and not have to worry about did my VM come back up as a like 99100, was it maybe 99101? It was always sort of like that challenge where you had to look up something in, on the VM to figure out where your service was running when really it should just run as localhost and you should be easy to, it should be easy to find. So what we built was something called VPN kit. And uh, by the way, all of these um, frameworks that I'll be mentioning are open source, so you can find them on GitHub and I'll have links at the end that kind of show you what, um, where to find them. Um, but VPN kit essentially is, uh, reconstructs the entire TCP IP um, like flow and translates them into what the OSX would actually trigger. So think of a Docker run, would go through our VPN kit, gets deconstructed and it reconstructed as if it came from an actual OSX process. This means that from an outside source, there's no difference. You could be running Safari, you could be running Docker run something, and they can't tell the difference because it all comes from the actual Mac socket. So the benefits that we gain from that is that really to firewalls, to VPNs, to anything on the outside, you have only one machine. We don't have two different IPs throwing you some sort of like TCP IP stack, TCP IP stack, and the VPN will usually, or the firewall will complain and say, well, you have one machine, how am I seeing two different types of layers and why is this not working? Um, so integrating it and making it native so that it comes from an actual OSX call just simplified everything for us. The other part of this is getting your local host working, right? So we wanted for a, an exposed port to be also accessible on the Mac OS X side of things. And once again, VPN kit has that built in where we basically bind um, the ports to the US X service and then also listens for any kind of like request on those ports. Um, what that allowed us to do is when you did a Docker run dash P or if you mapped an actual port, you could go to localhost 8080, localhost 80 and still see your service. Um, what that also solved is a lot of the OAuth operations where if you had OAuth sort of built in, localhost is an accepted um, sort of like callback. Whereas if you had a VM, the IP could have been different and you would need to always update 
workflow. Um, now that we've seen a little bit of all this, we'll go to our last pain point, which is really the, the file system sharing. With that, we built a, another framework called DataKit, which is really um, a translating uh, framework for the Linux file system to become OSX equivalent. So a little bit how the uh, VPN kit previously took your Docker run, TCP IP stack, and decomposed it to recompose it into an OSX call. We did the exact same thing with the data kit. Uh, so what that helps us is create that separation of the UIDs. Because if a container has a UID of you know, 1,000 and you're um, on your Mac on a host or on your OSX host, you're technically your own user, which is usually 500. The issue you kept running into if you ran something like MongoDB and you wanted your volumes to persist and you mounted your volumes is that MongoDB would complain and say, I do not have permission to write anything. And the fact that we now have this sort of like translation layer, we're able to sort of tweak these UIDs and say, well, MongoDB is trying to change it, but really in the container it's UID 1000, on the host it's UID 501, which means that to MongoDB it looks like its own files. And on the host, so to me, if I open up the folder, it actually looks like my own files. So this sort of solved the, the UID mapping issue. The other piece that we wanted to get working was the file system notification, where if you made a change on your host, those changes should be reflected inside of the container because it triggered an actual file system event. And once again, uh, DataKit was part of it, and we created what's called the OSX file system, so OSXFS is how we call it, that basically leverages those uh, OSX file system events and then translates them into iNotify events that it injects into the container. So if you are a Node developer, you can mount the entire volume, you can start developing, and your web servers, if you have obviously a file system watch, will basically trigger a rebuild of everything that you have because it knows that a file one of the files was changed or multiple files was changed. And it, that in itself is very, very powerful if you've ever dealt with those kinds of applications where you don't have to rebuild your container on every single file save. The, the time saving in development has been just tremendous in itself. So to summarize some of the benefits that we've seen in the new file system sharing is that we created an actual um, sort of new file system, which is the OSX file system that sort of bind mounts everything, which also means that I no longer have to remember to actually bind my, my volume from within the user directory. I can mount any kind of volume into the container. Uh, there's, a daemon, there's a daemon that actually listens for bidirectional file changes, so that means that not only does it help with UID mapping, but it also allows for actual file system events and notifications to go into the container and the container to react to it. Uh, everything runs as a user, which means that whatever file your user has access to, the container can have access to, but it will not have access to any of the uh, OSX host file systems. And we're planning to restrict uh, a little bit more of the host access just to make sure that we make it very secure and so that you don't end up with a user that bind mounts um, a directory they shouldn't. Um, and then also, as mentioned, all of these um, processes are sort of kept separate, which means that the container thinks it owns the files, and obviously the OSX host knows that it actually owns those files. This is a small little bonus, because there is a little bit more. I know I talked about three things, but I wanted to share one more um, sort of piece for this. Um, is that Docker for Mac actually supports multi-CPU um, architectures. If you're like a Raspberry Pi tinkerer and you're, use, you're using uh, your Raspberry Pi to do awesome things, like many do, you can actually build it from within a container, which means that if you pull this actual image and you do a uname like we did here, you'll see that it actually shows an ARMv7 and it thinks it's on a Raspberry Pi. So in summary um, of the open source components that we discussed today, we have HyperKit, which is a uh, lightweight virtualization toolkit on OSX. We have VPNKit, which is a library toolkit for embedding your virtual network. And we have DataKit, which is our modem 
modern, sorry, pipeline framework for distributed components. Uh, all these are open source components, so feel free to contribute to them, feel free to open up issues for them, or if you're actually using them in a certain, I don't know, in a cool way, independently from Docker for Mac, um, just ping us and say, hey, look at what I built, because it's pretty amazing. Um, as of July 28th, um, Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows are GA. They both shipped with Docker 112. Docker 112, as you may know, includes a lot of different features and a lot of like really cool stuff. And to introduce uh, you to some of these uh, new features, uh, I would like to introduce Nishant Totla. Um, I'm sure that you guys probably have some questions. What we're going to do is we'll let him go through the 112 features, and we'll basically both pair up to answer some of those questions. Can everyone hear me? Uh, thanks, Ben, for the talk and helping me with the mic. Uh, my name is Nishant. Uh, I'm uh, I'm an engineer on the uh, Docker um, core platform, uh, primarily working on uh, the new orchestration features. And uh, today I'm going to talk about some of the new features in Docker 112. Um, before I start, I want to mention that 112 is uh, by far the biggest release that we're doing for the Docker platform, probably the biggest after the launch of Docker itself, um, mainly because a lot of things have changed, a lot of new things have come up, and we're really excited about these uh, features. So uh, as you can see, this is a, a, a subset of the main features that we have. Uh, primarily, Orchestration is one of the biggest uh, things that has now become part of Docker. Um, a lot of people uh, are moving from single uh, host deployment, single host use cases of Docker to multi-host use cases, and they want a good orchestration system that's both easy to use, powerful, and has features that um, make lives easy. Uh, and with our new orchestration features, this is exactly what we've done. Um, there's a bunch of other features uh, that have gone into the engine, which we'll describe as we get to them. So the new orchestration feature called Swarm Mode um, is basically what makes your Docker engine cluster aware. So now when you have a Docker engine running, it, it actually knows that it's part of a cluster, and it knows how to talk to the other engines in the cluster and um, manage the distributed system. The easiest way to set up a cluster orchestration system now for Docker is Docker itself, because you get orchestration the moment you have engine. And the point of this is to make it really easy um, to use end-to-end, -end, from developers uh, running a small environment on their laptops or VMs to actual operators who are running large-scale deployments in, in clusters in production. So let me start with... Uh, describing how Swarm Mode actually works and the kinds of things it can do for you. Um, so as you can see, setting up a Swarm is as simple as one command. You say Docker Swarm init, and 
you have a one node cluster set up and running for you. And uh, the red engine over there that you can see is what got created uh, when you did a Docker Swarm in it. Next, what you can do is on a different machine uh, where you also have Docker running, you can say Docker Swarm join and point it to the original engine. And with that command, now you have a two node cluster running. Uh, they're both aware of each other uh, and they're ready to uh, run your tasks. You can do this as many times as you want. Um, in this case, we have a cluster of four engines uh, talking to the original red engine, which in this case acts as the manager. But what's more interesting is this. With 1.12 now, you can, in addition to running containers with Docker, you can run services. So what's a service? A service is different from a container in the sense that a service is a fully managed deployment that is controlled and handled by Docker. So a service allows you to specify a declarative state, which means that a service allows you to say that, okay, here's my application. This is what it looks like. This is, this is how I want it to run. This is how many copies it should have, and so on. And Docker will manage that for you. If something goes wrong, if a node goes down, if, if containers fail, Docker will make sure that your services keep running in the exact same state that you want. This is different from what you've been used to until now, where you just ran a container, and then um, if the container crashed, then it was up to you to restart it or to manage it. So here what you can see is uh, a command to create a simple service uh, that has that uses a front-end image um, this. So that uses a front-end image at the bottom. Um, the service command says that you want three replicas, which is three copies. You name it something. You attach it to an overlay network called MyNet, and you can publish a port. And what this does is that this creates three containers, uh, which are part of your service. It schedules them automatically on two engines. In this case, uh, these two engines. It creates the network, it attaches the containers to the network, and does everything you want. And you did not have to do anything but type this one command. You can create another service on the same network. In this case, we create a Redis service, um, uh, which is attached to the same network. In this case, you can see that the, um, the orange container here, which is part of the Redis service, got scheduled on the third engine. And they're all now connected by the same network. So again, really easy. Uh, you don't have to worry about how your containers are going to get scheduled, where they're going to go, uh, if, they'll, if they crash, what needs to be done. Docker manages all of that for you. So to demonstrate, um, let's say if this engine that is running two of our front-end containers actually fails. Um, gone away. Now you can see that the service, the front-end service, actually specified three replicas, but now we have only one running, so the desired state is different. So what um, Docker will do for you now is that it will actually add two more containers uh, on existing engines that are healthy and expand the network um, to the new, uh, excuse me, to the new nodes that, um, that have these containers. So again, once again, your deployment keeps running as you expect, even when the node failed. You can do more things. You can update your services. Uh, for example, you can scale it up. Let's say you want to scale your front end to twice the size, six containers. All you do is Docker service scale, and it creates three new containers, schedules them on existing nodes, and you're done. We also have the notion of global services. So a global service is typically something that runs on every single node in the cluster. Um, one of the common use cases for this could be uh, profiling or monitoring. So if you wanted to run a specific, task, a specific task on every single node, this is what you'd do. You just specify a mode called global, and it would run one instance of the service on each um, each node in the cluster. You can also do more things like specify constraints. 
For example, if these two engines on the right were started with, um, with these labels uh, to indicate that they had SSD storage, uh, and if your containers in your service actually needed that, you could use labels. So you start these engines, and while creating your service, everything else is the same, except you specify a constraint saying that I want labels uh, dot storage equal equals SSD to be satisfied. What that does is that it will uh, schedule all your containers only on nodes for, for uh, where those constraints actually hold. Um, Obviously, this also holds if you scale your service. So if I scale it to 10, uh, only these two nodes get used because of the constraint. And another cool feature that we have um, in orchestration is rolling updates. So the idea here is that a lot of times you want to update your service. Maybe you got a new version of the image that you're running or something changed. And you want to do this while keeping your deployment Live. You don't want to take down your deployment temporarily and completely replace it with a new one. So uh, for that, you have rolling updates, which means you update parts of your deployment um, one at a time uh, until your entire deployment is new. So in this case, we have the old service uh, using a front-end image uh, version 1, and it has eight instances, as you can see. Now. What you can do is you can say service update, um, update to a new image, version 2.0. And you can specify additional parameters like update delay and update parallelism. So update delay says that only update, uh, perform an update every 10 seconds. And this parallelism uh, flag says that only update two containers at a time. So when you do that, as you can see, the first time two containers get updated to the orange one, which is version 2.0, 10 more seconds later, two more of these containers got updated, and then two more, and then everything. So now you have a new deployment running version 2.0. There's a lot of nuances. There's a lot of um, extra things you can do. But this is super high level, and uh, this is just a taste of um, everything that's part of Docker 1.12. Next, we have security. So with Docker 1.12, uh, and especially with orchestration, one of the big things that we wanted to do was to have sensible security defaults. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have experience with setting up TLS, but if you've tried, it is really, really painful, and um, it goes wrong. And the, when it does not work, what most people do is, like, I'm not doing this. I don't need TLS. Um, and that's not a good thing, because security is important, and it shouldn't be that hard to use. So with 1.12, what you can do is, uh, with the commands that we saw, uh, when you create a cluster, it is secured by default. So in this case, um, we have a cluster with multiple managers and um, multiple agents. And each manager has its own uh, certificate authority, and it will create certificates, pass them down to agents. Certificate rotation is done automatically. Um, uh, node identities are cryptographic, and you can also integrate an external CA if you're if you want to do that. So the bottom line is that the cluster you create is secure secured by default, and you don't need to int um, interact with TLS at all. It is completely managed for you. Everything can be customized, obviously, for those who uh, who have specific requirements. Um, but we have sensible defaults in the um, in the cluster. The next thing that we have uh, is networking. Uh, the networking model has uh, changed slightly to um, accommodate the idea of services. So, in this case. Um, I'm going to tell you briefly what happens when you actually publish a port. So again, this is the same front-end service that we've been creating. Um, we attach it to a network, uh, and we publish port 8080. Um, what that does is that it exposes port 8080 on every node in the cluster uh, for this service. What that means is that 
regardless of where your containers are actually running, in this case, they're running on agent one and agent two, every node in the cluster um, exposes 8080. So if you hit myapp.com, which is the um, URL of your app in this case, uh, 8080, you can send that request to any of these nodes and it would internally get rerouted to an agent that is actually running your container. So this, this makes it really easy because you don't, you don't need to worry about where your containers are running and if a node fails or if uh, containers get rescheduled somewhere else, um, all of that is managed internally. Um, another thing is that we have an, uh, an internal load balancer. So all um, connections uh, requested for containers are um, essentially load balanced. So not the same container gets it every time. Um, you can also use an external load balancer if you're interested. So if you wanted to um, uh, expose these nodes altogether to an external load balancer and manage requests, um, you can do that. Uh, we have service discovery built in. Uh, there's an internal DNS server which, which resolves service names to IPs. So all of that is taken care of and networking is really easy to use. And uh, most importantly, I want to say that Swarm mode is a big shift in how Docker runs your containers. Um, it's, it's a lot of new things, uh, some of which uh, might be useful for you, some of which you may not yet be ready to try. But you should not be afraid to upgrade to Docker 112 because it is meant to be fully backward compatible. Uh, if you have existing deployments, if you have existing uh, orchestration systems, uh, if you have scripts, none of that is going to break. If you don't go into swarm mode, if you don't do the Docker swarm in it, then everything works the same way. Docker is just the Docker that you're used to. So um, that makes it easy to upgrade, and if you're interested in trying out swarm mode, you should definitely uh, give it a try. So that was the orchestration stuff. There's a few new things uh, apart from that. Uh, one of the things that the engine team is super excited about is the live restore feature. Um, in the past, when your Docker daemon crashed or if it went down, your running containers would also be affected. But starting with 112, that's not the case anymore. You can configure your Docker daemon um, with a live restore flag or uh, with a setting in your config file to say that if the daemon goes down, your container should keep running. And this is obviously super useful um, if you want to do upgrades or if you want to um, manage some downtime or if the daemon just crashes for some reason. Yet another thing that has been requested for a while is health checks. So now it is possible to define what it means for a container to be healthy. Um, so in this case, you can specify health checks in your Docker files when your image is built. Uh, if you see this example here, what it's saying is that at an interval of every five minutes, perform this check where you just uh, see if uh, the index page on your local host uh, can be curled and returned uh, and give it a timeout of three seconds. So every five minutes, you get three seconds to see if this actually works. Um, and if this fails three times in succession, then your container is declared as failed. Um, this is also something that works with the swarm mode. So now if you have a deployment on a cluster with um, several running containers of a service, uh, if some of those containers are unhealthy, failing for some reason, then they get killed and they get rescheduled. So all of that is managed for you internally. And finally, we have... Uh, some plugin um, subcommands that are currently experimental, uh, but uh, but these are completely new. Uh, it is now ma possible to manage plugins really easily. You can do plugin install. You can enable them, disable them from the command line. Um, it has a permissions model, so when you actually install a plugin, it'll tell you what kind of permissions it needs and if you're okay with that. So all of this makes usage of plugins really transparent and easy. Um, and I want to do a small demo just to sort of demonstrate how the services work and uh, to encourage you to try it out. So let's see 
how this will work. Yeah. So I'm I'm running a running this on Mac. So right. So I just have a fresh install of Docker for Mac, um, which Ben described, and just going to show you. That looks like, so on the top we have this uh, small Mobi icon. Um, it says Docker is running. Uh, everything seems fine. And when I do a Docker info, see, <clears throat> I can see here the regular stuff. Uh, but in addition, you'll notice that there is this swarm field here. Uh, currently, uh, can you actually see the highlighted stuff? I'm not sure how the contrast is. Uh, is it is it clear? Is that good? It's a little more. How about that? Yeah. All right, so you'll see that there's this swarm field, uh, which is currently inactive. So to create a swarm, all we do is docker swarm in it, and that's it. Uh, it creates a swarm. It gives you some additional instructions for how to add more nodes to the cluster. Uh, but for now, we are just going to create a one node swarm, uh, which is using Docker for Mac. So now if I run Docker info, I see that, um, where is swarm? Here. So now you see this additional information. It says swarm is active. The node has an ID. This one is a manager, um, and there's some additional features. Um, there's also one node in the cluster, as you can see here. You can do Docker node ls, and you'll see the one node. Um, now, what I'll do is I'll run a single service and show what that does. So. Um, Let's say we do docker uh, service create. I want to create three replicas. Um, and then I'm going to name it demo. And I'm going to use a busy box image and run top. So our service got created. And in to Docker service ls. You can see that this service is running. Um, you can do Docker service ts uh, with the ID to see the tasks that it is running. So these are the three instances, demo.1, demo.2, demo.3. They're all currently running. And so let's set a watch on that. So Docker service. Yes. Okay. Uh, and just to briefly demonstrate what happens if um, one of these containers actually goes down, I'm going to Docker PS. So I have these containers running. I'm going to pick one of these IDs. And then I'm going to Docker kill this. So what I'm doing here is I'm killing one of the containers manually. So what I would expect is that the service should detect that. It should um, create a new container to maintain the state that three replicas should be up. I do that. You can see on the right that um, of the yeah, it detected that one of these tasks fa tasks failed. Um, with some non-zero exit code, um, it started a new task. So now you have this new task that's running um, a few seconds ago. So that's the new task it started, maintaining the state. Um, we, there's, there's a lot more that can be demoed, including rolling updates, which is really easy. But uh, if you're interested, we can talk about that um, after the talk. Or um, you can come, come to me later, and then we can talk about it more. Uh, 
that is it any you can talk into it Uh, for orchestration and production, and I see you guys are kind of catching up to some of the features. That I was wondering if you thought there's any advantage uh, right now to um, Swarm versus something like Kubernetes. Um, so the the main kind of uh, thing that we've gone for with Swarm is uh, the ease of setup and deployment. And given that it is part of Docker, uh, it enables us to do things um, that are that make uh, creation and management of the cluster and the deployments running on it really easy. Um, other orchestration systems uh, typically run on top of Docker uh, using the Docker engine as um, just an agent in the cluster and typically involve a lot more setup steps and a lot more management. Uh, so that's one of the huge advantages. Um, in terms of the features, um, so uh, with 112, obviously we have a good set of features that we, we think are really useful for most deployments and you're still getting feedback from people as, as to what, what are the features they need the most and uh, we are actively building more features. So I think in the long run, uh, one of the biggest advantages that I can see for um, this orchestration system is that it's it will be part of Docker and it will be really easy to use and um, it supports Docker uh, as a native uh, container runtime. Just toss it. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm really excited about Docker for Mac uh, and especially about our local development workflow using Docker for Mac. Uh, one thing I've noticed with Docker Toolbox and Docker for Mac is the performance uh, impact with mounting the volume uh, compared to what it looked like doing local development on a bare metal MacBook before. And that's kind of like making it difficult for our developer adoption. And like right now we're using like NFS and Docker Toolbox and it's okay, but like my hope was when Docker for Mac came out that all the X Hive stuff would like kind of like crack this and we'd get like close to bare metal performance with mounted volumes. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, um, so really for like Duck for Mac, um, we were more focused, especially during like our beta, and we just got out of beta and to GA, and the whole point was to get it more feature complete than actually focus on the performance. Yeah. So we've, we've got all the tools to make it work, and now we just have to focus on the performance. I mean, like, so the, uh, where you're seeing that the performance hit is when we do sort of like that translation, right? Like we're yeah. the, at that layer, and that's why you're seeing it. And but. Technically, we have everything that we need. We just need now to sort of like improve on it. And to give you an example, <clears throat> we had a little bit of spare time before like DockerCon and we wanted to sort of like improve a little bit of that performance. And our engineers spent maybe like a, a day in it. And I think we went up 10x in performance. So we're gonna put some time into it. And so it's gonna come. It, it, it's just that we didn't have time before. We wanted to get, get it more feature complete. And now that we have a little bit more time, we have the features that we want in it. It's easier for us to sort of like improve it. Right, improvement is usually a little bit easier than creating everything. So, oh. so um, we're actually giving out T-shirts for good. Questions. Oh yeah, yeah, good so, question. Uh, questions are. In I don't know terms. what's your size. I guess. I don't like either. All right, do you want to do that? Cool. All right, she'll talk to the lady, sir. So yeah, nice presentation, guys. So. Uh, Docker Swarm is very interesting. So what do you guys use for your database uh, for your configuration management? Um, so could you uh, maybe clarify the question? I'm not exactly sure what you're So asking. Docker Swarm might be saving all the states of where this oh. process is running, uh, right. which container is running where, right. and all the port mappings and everything. So usually people like Kubernetes use XCD. Right, do right. you use some? Something similar? Or? Yeah, so we actually have an inbuilt draft store um, that is built on top of um, etcd, but it is part of the uh, swarm itself. Um, so I did not go very deep into that, but 
see. Um, so this is a diagram of the topology of what it looks like. So you have uh, workers, which are the green nodes at the bottom, which are engines, and then you have managers, which you can run, um, which are also engines, but they have the additional responsibility of managing the distributed state, um, managing uh, uh, essentially scheduling and all of those things. And all those managers are connected together as part of a raft consensus group. So all of this stuff is part of the raft store. So every manager or every node in the Docker Swarm will be part of the managers group or? Only the managers. So oh, okay. when, you, when you start a cluster, which is, let's say you start with a one node cluster, um, that, cl that node becomes a manager. But then when you add more nodes to your cluster, all of those only get added as workers. Uh, but you can promote some workers to become managers depending on your requirements. And all the managers uh, only are part of the consensus group. So the point is that if a manager crashes, then you have um, enough replication to be able to restore uh, the Thanks. state. Hi, I actually have one question for each of you. I could. Um, for the swarm, you um, showed the script that did the health check. Um, is there actually a, a way for it to notify us uh, that, that something failed? Um, or do we still have to have some sort of an external pinging mechanism to be able to tell that something failed? Um, that, that's a good question, and that's one we've, we've been getting a lot. Um, so right now, uh, in general, we, we, we have some ideas, and we've been thinking about how better to kind of uh, give feedback to the cluster um, operator about what's, if something's going wrong in the cluster, if tasks are failing, if uh, something needs attention. Um, so right now, if containers are failing because of health checks, uh, the only way to sort of figure that out would be to uh, go to individual nodes and check the logs there. But soon enough, we, we will have a more um, sort of centralized mechanism where you could actually query the distributed state of the cluster, um, get an idea of what's failing, and there's something that you need to do. And at that point, then we could uh, think about having uh, some sort of mechanism or some sort of pinging mechanism uh, that would notify you. Okay. But it, it's coming soon, and it's, it's definitely a high, um, high value and highly requested feature. Sure. And the question for uh, the Mac, um, uh, if you have a mounted volume uh, currently with the Docker Mac, um, if, you brought, if you've downloaded an image, um, you mentioned that it had access to the local file system, right? Yep, that's correct. So is it possible for a third party to go up several levels out of the thing and access? No, because you only share whatever you're providing, right? So like even if you like provide like, so one of the, so we, we share sort of like the common user folders right now. So if you go into the, actually I'm gonna use this laptop real quick, but in the, um, in the preference panel, we actually have sort of like that notion of like locking it down a little bit more. Um, where you can actually specify the folders that get shared, right? Ah. So if you wanted, you could actually take some of them out. We sort of like mounted the typical ones that most users wanted to use, um, but you can add some, you can remove some. Um, but really, when you bind mount a certain folder, there's no way for the container to really come back out, right? Because to it, it just it, it just mounts at the root of whatever you're saying, okay. right? So like if you're sharing like volumes, it's just volumes and it just knows about volumes. It doesn't know how to go back up to it. So you, you can kind of sandbox it. But by default, right. these, aren't, these aren't the defaults, are they? The yeah, users? these are the defaults. These are the defaults, so they can yep. get the, the users. So you can go up users. Right. Well, but yeah, so if you mount like users, then yeah, technically you gave your container access to users, right? But uh, you're technically doing it, right? Like, so you should know that you're given access to the entire user folder. It's like telling me that you're mounted the source folder and you don't want it to have access to images, but the images folder is within the source. It's you know that it's in there. I mean, we're obviously, we're, we try to help you and we try to protect you, but if, ultimately, if you type in your password in like clear text, you know, there's nothing I can do for you. We should be careful then. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just like everything else, right? I mean, you're, you're online and you're, I don't know, you just, but yeah, otherwise it's all there, so you can, you can add it, and if you wanted, you know, you could take out users and then just put your actual users if you wanted, right? You could customize it to be only for that user. Thanks. Yeah, so, um, um yeah, don't, don't move it around. It's like, it, it's kind of like a little, like, JavaScript thing. Yeah. 
that's the same type of thing here. Um, so, so in terms of question. So, um, repeating the question uh, you asked, your first question is um, what network driver is used uh, for the networking in Swarm? Um, so, the, net, the, the networking that I showed, the MyNet that I created, uh, is an overlay network, and that gets that's that's what services use. So. Uh, if you're familiar with the net, uh, overlay or host networking drivers from previous Docker versions, uh, this is slightly different. Uh, this is, but to sort of, is that is that what you're looking for? Um, As I saw this recent presentation on, from Cumulus, and they talked about different networks and when you scale up the the type of performance hit. Um, and so I was kind of curious the underlying. Where the Docker engine uses for the network driver to set up the network between right. So um, the way that happens is actually you can see it in this diagram um, using a gossip network between the workers in the cluster. Um, and I'll just move to a different slide. So uh, each of the all of the workers that are actually going to run your tasks uh, or containers. Um, they have a gossip network which shares networking information, uh, and that is how uh, the, the entire cluster gets to know of uh, any of the networking-related uh, structures uh, that, that they need to know. Um, oh, uh, actually, I'll let Mike answer that. Mike is the uh, product manager for the core runtime. So uh, yeah, so, so the answer to your question is that in Docker 1.12, uh, we only support the overlay uh, network driver, but in Docker 1.13, our plan is to support any third-party driver. So the drivers you've seen, we would support, and uh, Mac VLAN is another common request. It basically, there was only so much we could do by the 1.12 code freeze. So right now, we only support overlay, but we're planning to enhance that. Oh, uh, sorry, could you repeat your second question? Yeah, and, and the other question I had is like, so I'm not familiar with Storm, Swarm, so what I See, it's like to swarm in it. Where does they get created? Like, is that AWS, GCE? Is there some here? Right. So uh, the question is, where where does it get created? Uh, is it on AWS, GCE, or something else? So when when you have a Docker engine running and when you do Docker swarm in it, um, what happens is that this engine becomes part of a raft consensus group. In this case, just one node. Uh, and there is a raft state that needs to be stored somewhere. Uh, I'm not sure if I, I think we have a default location on the file system for that. If you're if you're running it on on your machine, uh, but I think if you're uh, creating a swarm on AWS or GC, there would be different locations. Um, with with Docker for AWS and Docker for Azure, which which are currently in beta. I think um, one of the things that that they would do for you is make creation of the swarm uh, really simple uh, on these uh, infrastructures. But to answer your question, fundamentally there is uh, a raft state which needs to be stored somewhere. Um, yeah, that's. Tricky selection. Cleaning up a lot of old images, like when I do Docker images, I have gigs and gigs and gigs of images of leftover. We expect maybe a clean trip soon. Yeah, I mean, garbage collection is like one of those things that I think everybody wants. Um, I don't know what the uh, actual plan is, but I know that even like internally, you know, I have the same problem, right? Where you see and you're like, all right, I guess I should probably clean up all this stuff and actually remove the images. Uh, Tibor here actually is part of like the entire right. like core engine, and he'll probably explain. So actually, there's an open issue on that on GitHub somewhere, and it's something that's being planned for 1.13. Uh, can't promise, but we know it's a big pain point. Uh, it's a big pain, uh, and we're trying to fix that. So 1.13, hopefully. Sorry, just to be clear, it's uh, some commands to give you better output for your um, 
older or data management, like to know how, what is taking how much space and uh, it, it, there, will, there won't be anything that automatically removes it. Thank you. Thank you for all of your questions. And now I will introduce Neil, who will uh, talk from HP, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. What's going on here? Okay. Why is it not showing? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Should be working now. Oh, nothing. Uh, we had it. Uh, yeah, what's your yeah. arrangement? Go to uh, oh, arrangement. arrangement. See. Yeah. Okay, so it's right there. Where's the? Uh, we see what the slide is. Oh. Gestures so we can see all the uh, on the F. Oh, I guess. Yeah, you can just do F3. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Am I too loud? Uh, okay, great, thanks. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Neil. I'm uh, with HP Software, and um, you can reach me reach me there on Twitter. Uh, just a show of hands, how many people here are developing uh, microservices? Okay, a good, a good fair number. Thank you so much. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, in-cluster continuous testing framework for, for Docker uh, containers. This is new, we've never ever actually presented this before, so this is a proof of concept. Um, and our development team uh, has, been, has been working on it um, for the last couple of months or so. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank Docker for enabling us to uh, give us this forum to, to speak to you about this, particularly Lisa and, and uh, Victor, who've been really helpful to uh, get us on this, on this topic. So let me just start, uh, first of all, our development team, I wish they could be here. They're, they're really the brains behind this operation. And so I'm just representing them. Our mission within HP is like, we're like an incubation group. We actually develop new ideas and we try proof of concepts out there to see which ones work, particularly related to cloud native applications um, built as microservices and, and containers. So the first thing we want to do is sort of introduce something called Tugbot, and Tugbot is basically a take on, take off on Tugboat, which is the ability for a Tugboat to bring containers safely to port. This is what Tugbot does, is basically takes containers, brings them safely into production, uh, and that's what we're trying to do. The one difference uh, here in, in Tugbot itself, um, we plan, it's not part of a, a CI, it's sort of outside the CI process, it's about actually running uh, continuous testing, making continuous testing real in any environment. So if you have a dev environment running a swarm cluster that uh, Nishan talked about, 
and you want to move them, uh, then you can move that into, into a test environment or into a staging or into production. Uh, you can have testing growing continuously for different types of things. It's not just a single service that you're going to run as part of your CI process, but it's actually running uh, and checking the health of your system overall, not, not only just a single service, but multiple services talking to each other in a cluster. Uh, and and that's, that's what it's designed to do. There's really just three components to Tugbot itself. One is the, the Tugbot uh, container itself, in which runs a, a run service, a collect service, and a result service. And the result service also has an API that you can, uh, you can hook into. The results are actually captured into Elasticsearch uh, and then displayed or visualized via Kibana. Uh, we also can put it into a product that we have, basically that looks at not only microservices uh, running in, in Docker containers, but also can look at all the traditional applications, non-containerized applications, and shows the analytics across your whole system within the organization. A test container is, is no different than any other type of container. It's, it's simply the content here is a test, um, and it gets shipped into production just like any other container would get shipped into production. The one, one key thing here that we're, that we're talking about is that now you can actually wrap all your testing within the same behavior that you already have. If you already know how to build Docker containers, then running tests for Docker containers the same way. You create a Docker file for, for the test itself. You can use any tool uh, within the container. It doesn't really matter what the tooling is, uh, but th the idea is to create that, uh, that framework. We also leverage the, the Docker API uh, to basically look at, uh, especially for the events, so we can actually trigger, uh, trigger tests based, based on, the, on Docker events. So if you're familiar with the, anybody, how many people went to DockerCon? Okay, a few of you. So at DockerCon, they were using this as the voting app, the demo app at, at DockerCon. So we're gonna use this, the, the same app for, for the demo, uh, and hopefully the demo gods are gonna be with me. I just don't know where my shot of espresso is. I need one of those, but I think Brian was taking a shot of espresso before he went on stage. So again, this has never been done live, so we're gonna do this live. Hopefully this will all work uh, so forgive me if it doesn't, okay? So this is the flow we're gonna walk through. We're gonna just deploy this app, and for expediency's sake, I've already deployed the app. And then we're gonna deploy the, the Tugbot test container. So I'm just gonna go through that right now. Okay, can you guys see this? Is this, is this big enough? So I've deployed the app already, but I'm just going to show you that there's five services of that app that are running currently. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is we sort of just created this in script so it's easier to um, just uh, deploy them. So I'm now going to run a, a deploy script that basically what I would do normally if, if I was using Ansible or if I was using any other orchestration engine, you would normally do this through an orchestration engine and deploy it. But here we're just going to deploy it uh, normally here. So what, what this basically does, it just starts the, the Tugbot services, and there's five uh, uh, of Tugbot services that we showed. The three of them are the uh, important ones. The one that's the, uh, let's see if I can. Uh, so you can see that there's a collect service there that gets started. Uh, there's a result, the Tugbot itself gets started, and then there's a result service that also gets started. So all those things you can start it. Plus we're starting Elasticsearch and Kibana as well as part of this. So this, uh, everything here is available on GitHub, so you can download it and play with it as well. The next we're gonna do is just we're gonna configure Kibana. Now we're, we're downloaded, we're just gonna configure it, so let it, let it go through and, and configure Kibana. And now we're gonna actually, this command here, let me just clear this so you can see it on the top of the screen. Oops, I went in uh, <laughs> sleep mode. Okay, bring it back up. So the one thing here to remember is that um, what we're now doing is basically deploying the first run 
of the Tarbot container. Now, this is normally, we'll do this, we we'll do this now, but normally you would again deploy this through your normal orchestration means. So if you're using Swarm or Kubernetes, that's what would run it. But the first run of the container is gonna get deployed now. Um, and it's gonna set up um, the, the container to be now looking at this. If I, if I were just doing Docker PS now, what you'll notice is that, let me just shrink this down a little bit. So you'll notice that right now you don't see anything in the names here that says Tugbot on it, right? Because it's the first run we have run now. So now what we're gonna do is basically um, deploy By the way, by now, let's just go take a look at see if, um, if Kibana is back up. We just wanna make sure our app is also back up. All right, so here's, your, here's the app that we deployed, okay? I can vote, right? And it changes, so you'll notice that the app's actually working. We haven't done anything yet. All we've done is started an app, and we're just uh, taking a vote, okay? So the app is running normally. We'll also go to, uh, to Kibana and, and right now you will see the, the first set of tests that we just ran. Okay. When I launched the run test, uh, that's basically what it did was run the, run the first test. Make sure clear. So basically the Tugbot container itself is that one image. There's only one invocation and we run five tests per that invocation. Now you can run any number of tests. It's, it's really, really up to you. And there's been no failures so far. So now what we're gonna do is introduce, introduce some failures. So we're gonna fail the test, okay? So I just pass the command bad. Again, it's just a script. And, and this will basically, what it will do is run the same five tests and two of them will fail. Okay. And they're both, they're both in the, one is in the UI and one is a verification. So if I go back to my app now, if I click on cats, because you notice that the little checkbox is not there anymore, right? First time you saw the little checkbox and this time you don't see that, okay? So that, that's the UI part of the, the verification fail there. So now let's go back. And now we can go back to Kibana and see that we just ran this bad test. You should see more results uh, coming in. So now that was a second invocation of the container. We run another five tests and two of them fail. And that's, that's what we're showing here. So here you can see that basically I've got one invocation and two failures. And here we got one invocation and zero failures. So those, that's what sort of matches up with the two units over there that you're seeing. The other thing you're seeing down here now, interesting over here is that this says total test duration. The total test duration is because the top line, so is, it's more duration because we ran five tests, essentially. And since all of them passed, the duration is higher. But we're running a Mocha test here. And the Mocha test, generally, when it fails, it doesn't give you a duration at all. Right? So basically says, oh, it's zero. So we don't get really a time there. So we can't. That's where you're seeing the decrease, it, decrease in, in, in the line. But if you go down below, you can see each of those tests. The two that goes down to zero are the two failure tests, but then everything else you can see on the second invocation, you'll see varying speeds of, of the test. It depends on the environment and, and what that is. Okay. We can now go down and look at the actual, these are the sort of the same, it maps just in bar form to the other one, but we can go look at the fail test. If I click on fail, and I'm gonna go apply this filter over here to the top. I'll just clear this for a second. If I apply this filter down here, and I can just go look at these fail tests. So you'll see what happens if I go to fail, and I look at the actual raw data here, which comes in JSON, and you can see that here's my failure, uh, failure result that I'm gonna show coming up. So this, what we do is we basically are standardizing uh, the test results coming into there. So depending on, no matter what type of test you run, you can basically have the results get translated into JSON and push to Elasticsearch, we can then visualize. So this allows you to visualize the whole, whole system uh, looking in. Again, we're talking about tests that are running in real environments, not in, in just your dev environment, not just as part of your build or CI, side, uh, CI process, okay? So now let's go back just to get sort of more, more data. We're just gonna run 
there's a script it's just created. So now we're going to deploy. Uh, let me just deploy the. So I'm going to like roll back to the good version now, right? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to roll it back to the good version. And now I'm going to just run run this test and just what it does is it deploys the uh, creates the problems again or creates failures again and rolls back to the previous version. Create failures, rolls back to the previous version. I'm going to do this five times. So it's just a loop, and we're just going to run that to just collect more data. Okay. So while this thing is running, you can still go to the app. App's still working, right? Still working, fine, no problem. But we can go now to Kibana, and we're going to clear these results. You can now see that we're like, it's it's running many invocations and five test cases per invocation. And you start to see a trend. The important thing is you're looking at this data over time. If you're running this continuously, the trend is what's really important. Because then you can see that if you introduce something or introduce a problem in the application or your service, you can start to see the impact of that in a real production environment or real staging environment, even in fact, before it goes into production. You will discover some errors that you wouldn't normally discover as part of your uh, CI process. And hopefully this will you know, prevent the user from seeing the error before you will. Okay. There can be lots of things that happen in a real environment. For example, the operator can update an image. You can change a security rule or security policy. Those types of things that impacts on real environment, you don't really know that because your services are running uh, in that environment and you want to know what's going to happen. Any event, you can actually run these things on any particular event, okay? And that's, that's the beauty of it. So now what I'm going to do is, is switch back, and let's just break out of this for a second. Okay. So that's, in a nutshell, what, what talk about is, is, is all about. It's basically allowing you to run testing continuously, 24 by 7, 365, and because we can do this for microservices, it allows us to run it in different, different types of environments. I'm going to also now demonstrate another thing. One of the new utilities we created is something called uh, Pumba. Pumba is based on the uh, Disney character. Um, it's silly. It's weak-minded. That's, that's, that's what it is, and that's the notion of Pumba. It's basically what it does is injects chaos in, into your system. This was inspired by Netflix's Simeon Army. If those people have used Netflix, you know what that is, except now it's applied to containers itself. So we can randomly kill containers, pause containers, delay containers, and we're using a lot of the Docker APIs to do that. Right? that that's what we're basically using to enable it. The Docker gives us these capabilities, and it's really, really simple for us to execute. And right now, all this doing is injecting chaos. You still need, like, we have a load and performance testing tool that actually will have to take that data and then decide, oh, did your container come back up? Did your service come back up? Right, but right now, we're just going to inject some failures in here. Now, this is a tricky part. I hope this works, because sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So all, all, this, all this is going to do is basically um, we, have a, we have a feature that we just added recently. It's called network emulation. Scorla virtualizes the, the different type of network environment. So you can introduce a network delay for inter-communications. Inter uh, and here, we're just going to run a network emulation that basically is going to inject a delay of three seconds. Okay. So what you should see. Uh, when we do this, is if you go to the app, when I click on the vote, when I vote, the, res the results will actually be delayed by three seconds. Okay, that's, that's what you should see. Okay, now it takes a little while to come, uh, come back up because it's actually going and looking at the, the five or six, seven containers out there, and it's looking at uh, those. And then because there's five services for that app, it's going to look at all those five services and start to like inject uh, delays into it. So it takes about 30 seconds or something to come back up. So let's go back in the mean, meantime, we can play with the vote. And you can see that, hey, I can still vote. I still have that error that I haven't really uh, rolled back to the good version. So it's still there. But by now, let's go back and take a look and see if it's come, come back up. So Puma is running. It's still not running yet. OK, now it's running. So you can see that we've now added a delay here of, of 3,000 milliseconds. So let's go back to the app. And hopefully, this is the test. It should work. If I hit dogs, it takes 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. And that's, that's where it should change. Let's try cats. Okay. 
Not yet. Let's see, go, let's go back and take a look and see where it's at. Sometimes it takes a little wide, while depending on the network you're running on and the environment you're in. So let's try it again. Two, three, Okay, this one's not working, so it's okay, but you can try it in your own environment. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is where the demo gods weren't kind to me today, so that's fine. But it, it works sometimes. It doesn't work all the time. It's, like I said, it's still proof of concept. So that's, that's about it. I'm gonna kill this. Um, it's really simple. Let me go back and, and finish up. Okay, so what we just went through was this workflow. We basically started the, the container first. Uh, it picks the test containers from, from GitHub just like you would normally expect it to do. And then after the first run, it starts, talk about automatically discovers new test containers. You don't have to do it after that. It's, it's, it's totally automatic. It will discover all the new containers. In fact, I should probably show you that. Let me let me show you that and and go back. If I now let's take a look here, if I run Docker PS, okay, you will notice you will notice that the first time the the Mocha test ran, Tugby wasn't labeled. Oh shoot, hang on. Okay, you guys see that? You can see that the first time uh, Tugbot didn't run, but every successive test that we ran after that, you can see that Tugbot automatically picked them up. So it discovers those test containers and then runs the test accordingly. Switch back. So, that's basically what it's doing. We just worked through the uh, process. We just demoed the process. That's all, that's all it's doing. Now, some of the use cases we were looking at when we were thinking about this is one, we wanted to actually have a simple and standardized way to test in any environment. Okay? It didn't matter, and what, what Nishan showed you about running Swarm, that's the next thing we're gonna add is the ability to deploy it using Swarm or Kubernetes, for example. And so we can start to do some, some testing within within a, a cluster uh, using or integrate with, with those uh, orchestration engines. We also wanted to add uh, event-driven testing because we figured that anytime you have a, a system running, whether you're running in your, on your dev box or whether you're running in a staging environment or in, uh, in, 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 um, in production, you wanna be able to uh, test or check for things on certain events that can happen. Uh, Right now we support all, all the Docker events, uh, but we're uh, planning to add other types of events like cron or host or kernel updates or OS images, et cetera. So any of those external events or user defined event even, you can uh, decide when you wanna test it. The other thing we did was we stand, standardized the collection of all these test results. And that's really important because right now you have different formats for different test results and it's really hard to know what's happening. When you have a collection of microservices that can grow to hundreds or tens of thousands, it, it becomes really important to know what's happening over time and also uh, important to know the different types of tests that will have an impact on your system. So we do get the test context and this is, this is you know, part of the events or hooking into the, the Docker remote API gives us the test context as well, which is part, not only do you see the stats and, and, the, and, and what's happening with pass fail, you actually see the, the, the context of the test itself over time. So you can see that and then and improve, improve your system. The last thing also we did is by standardizing on creating test containers, we were basically uh, enabling people to now share them. So just like GitHub uh, did for social coding, we think social testing would be another way to do it. You can now share containers to everybody. We did this with Docker Bench, for example. We took the Docker Bench uh, scripts, we containerized them, and then pushed it out, uh, out to Docker Hub, and it's wrapped in a test container so anybody can use it. So 
So if we were creating and you were creating a bunch of tasks for different containers, you can put them into, into Docker Hub or Docker Shrush's registry, and you can start sharing that with people just like you share code on GitHub. Makes, makes life a little bit easier. In terms of the architecture, that's what it looks like. It's not really very complicated. Um, we, like I said, we just right now hooked into Docker events. Those are the ones we support, and eventually we'll end up supporting like other types of events. The main thing is that it goes through a result service API, and that's really where the hard work is. You actually kind of have to convert the results and associate it with the events that are running, uh, and that gets pushed out to, to Elasticsearch. If you want to see the simple, the, the test Docker file is very, very simple. It's really five lines. The top two basically, you know, in this case we're looking, uh, the command here is docker bench, but you could be any test that you wanted to run. But the three, we're using the docker label here to describe, uh, to tell that, hey, this test container should be run, run by Tugbot. Uh, the docker events here are basically just a list of comma separated docker events. Some of the next steps and open items that are open for discussion, and this is where we would love, love your input. Uh, one is if you're running this continuously in, in environments, you know, and the environment keeps changing, your services keep changing, you know, and if you're running these tests all the time, is, it gonna be, is, there, is there gonna be some performance impact or is there gonna be a barrier to speed of deployment? So that's something that's an open question. We're trying to figure out whether it is or isn't. Uh, we want to do some test optimizations. I think Nishan talked about parallelism. Like we want to integrate, that's the reason we want to integrate with Swarm and, and Kubernetes to sort of uh, look at those types of things so we can, we can actually do this. One of the next steps on, the, on our to-do list is adding the granularity that we want. For example, now we want to do a test selection based on a very, very specific container rather than a, all the containers in the cluster. So we want to be very, very selective so you can decide when you want to run. If you don't want to run it across the board, you can, do, you can be very, very specific. Uh, and last, we already talked about integrating with the uh, orchestration engines. Every, everything here is, is uh, available on GitHub. Uh, so we, we hope that uh, you go there and take a look or contribute. We're, we're happy to uh, accept any, any pull requests. Uh, but tell us what you think. I, I'll be around here af after this, and so feel free to come up and ask me any questions. Um, Gaia, which I didn't talk about, it's sort of looking at development workflow analytics on top of this by leveraging all the data that's coming from not only tests, but development as well directly. And I'll just give you sort of a snapshot of what, what that kind of looks like. We're tracking like commit frequency, you know, teams are using different languages so we can decide, hey, who's, who's got the expertise in this particular language so we can go talk to them. Uh, that kind of stuff is kind of important so we can look at which, which developers committing the which, uh, the most amount of code, the most frequent amount of code, the most recently, so we will know, hey, if somebody's doing work on Go, we, we want to be able to go talk to that person who knows Go so we can pair program with them, perhaps. You know, so that, that's the types of things we're looking at, um, but there's, it's, you know, we're still very, very early in, in those stages. So I thank you very much. Uh, please uh, ask me any questions. I'm, I'm open for that. So thanks so much, everyone, for coming. Um, and thanks to our speakers, Ben, Nishant, and Neil. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I'm sure they'll stick around and answer a few questions if you have any for them. And then can I please just ask you uh, to kind of clean up your garbage. We have trash cans at either end of the room. But feel free to finish the pizza, have another beer, mingle. Um, and thanks again for coming. Thanks, Lisa.